But welcome to our Passport to 2044 session on planning for deeply affordable housing. This case kind of um, zero to 30 area median income housing, emergency housing, that type of thing. So really appreciate everyone's uh, participation here today. I'm Liz Underwood-Boltman. I'm a principal planner with Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, and we have been um, organizing this Passport to 2044 webinar series to support uh, the comprehensive plan updates. Um, this is our 15th webinar. Um, and I think we're nearing wrapping up with our webinar series, but um, there have been a variety of webinars so far on a lot of different topics. And uh, we've got recordings and all the materials from our past sessions available on our website. Um, if you want to um, peruse um, any of those resources that we've uh, had in the past. Uh, Department of Commerce has also launched a webinar series to support jurisdictions planning uh, for the uh, for 2025 adoption. Um, so you can check out that series too. They're touching on a few topics that we um, didn't quite get to. So also a good resource. Um, so today I'm just going to uh, have a, kind of a focused presentation from uh, Department of Commerce um, talking about the resources that they have on planning for zero to 30 percent AMI. Um, we also have a local example from the city of Olympia talking about um, their local approaches to uh, this work. Uh, we'll also have time for Q&A. Um, we had some great questions in during the registration um, and we'll I'm sure have more questions as kind of the session comes along. Um, we got a lot of great questions and just want to freely admit that you know we have an hour today and we'll get on we'll touch on as many things as we can, but um, this is a complex topic and we, we may certainly may not get to everything and answer all the questions today. Um, PSRC has a variety of housing planning related resources that you might be um, interested in as you update your comprehensive plans. Um, I'll mention just a couple of them here today. Um, we have the Housing Incentives and Tools Survey, which is uh, a survey we did a couple of years ago to understand what housing tools local governments have adopted in this region. So um, I think it's a really great resource to kind of just a lay of the land, understanding what's been adopted locally, um, and it gives you kind of some pointers as to where you might um, find some examples. Um, in the region. Uh, we also did some outreach to affordable housing developers last year and kind of listened to some common uh, findings they had had about um, where they may be seeing some barriers to developing um, affordable housing. So I think that that could also be a, a useful resource in this context as well. Um, and we also have just a variety of other types of planning resources from climate change to economic development to equity topics to transportation. So um, all on our website um, and of course happy to help support the plan updates in any way that we can. Um, so just in terms of some logistics today, uh, we will be recording the session. So we'll have a recording available on our YouTube page um, at, in, uh, in the near future um, to, um, as, as a resource. Um, if you have a question during the presentations, we have a Q&A box. So please feel free to um, add questions and we'll uh, try to get to that towards the end. Um, and I'll just note that we have uh, a very short survey at the end of the um, webinar on our, that helps us sort of fulfill our Title VI obligations. So um, just an FYI on that. So with that, I am going to pass it off to Laura Hodgson at Department of Commerce to talk about um, some of the resources and guidance that they have. Laura. Hello, thank you for having me here today. So as many of you are aware, in 2021, HB 1220 was passed to encourage local governments to use their authority to better plan for housing in this housing crisis. It strengthened the GMA housing goal from encourage affordable housing to plan for and accommodate housing for all economic segments. It also updated the housing element requirements in the way shown on the screen. These include the requirement for the Department of Commerce to identify projected housing needs for each income bracket, and we did so at the countywide level. This includes a segment for permanent supportive housing, which is housing for those in the lowest income segment, zero to 30% of area median income that prioritizes people who need comprehensive support services and who are experiencing homelessness or who are at risk of homelessness. And also includes a separate segment for housing for emergency housing and emergency shelters quantified in terms of housing beds. Then the local requirements were augmented um, a little bit and to include identifying sufficient capacity of housing needs for all income levels and making adequate provisions for all housing needs. And that segment of the regulations was 
clarified what it meant to make adequate provisions. Previously, it just said make adequate provisions and now includes documenting barriers to housing availability, documenting actions needed to achieve housing availability and consideration of ADUs and housing near employment. And there were a few other pieces of planning within the housing element that were also updated. But these are the two that I would like to touch on today because they overlap with how local governments can best plan for deeply affordable housing in their jurisdictions. So this is to set the stage for um, the background the, of comprehensive plans. But specifically today, what are we talking about when we talk about deeply affordable housing? When we're talking about deeply affordable housing and the terms that I'll be talking about today from the state perspective, we're talking about emergency shelters, emergency housing, transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, and extremely low income housing. And just by means of understanding what that is, emergency housing means temporary indoor accommodations for individuals or families who are in at risk of homelessness um, and that does not, may or may not require a lease. Emergency shelters is very similar. It provides temporary shelter for individuals or families who are currently homeless and they it may or may not require a lease. Permanent supportive housing, as I mentioned, is subsidized leased housing with no limit on stay that prioritizes people who need support services and who were uh, homeless or at imminent risk of homelessness. Transitional housing is another step in this process of, of house, the housing continuum, which provides housing and supportive services to homeless persons or, ham or families who, for up to two years, and it helps to transition people into um, independent living. And then extremely low income housing is uh, permanent housing, uh, leased housing that is um, available to individuals and uh, who are earning um, zero to 30 percent of area median income. And all of these housing types are, are things that planners now need to incorporate in their comprehensive plans and development regulations. And while they are kind of new to us. Um, they are very critical to our housing ecosystem and something that requires some careful thought and attention. So what we'd like to talk about today is how does that um, play out as you work under comprehensive plans and development regulations and how do we encourage this type of housing, which is typically highly subsidized housing um, and what can local governments do to uh, come alongside of nonprofits and um, state and local partners in encouraging this type of housing in their communities. Um, what we think um, the steps for doing so to encourage this deeply affordable housing uh, kind of fall into five different steps that we've outlined here and we'll talk about in more detail. The first is to develop strong policies to encourage deeply affordable housing. It's important to set the stage and the framework and the vision for your community that your community supports and wants to encourage deeply affordable housing. This will set the stage for other policies and your land use and zoning um, decisions that you'll make as well as your permitting and other decisions um, such as potential financing that, that you can um, elect to do within a local government. Then as I mentioned, uh, Taking those policies and implementing them requires allowing emergency housing, emergency shelters, transitional housing, and permanent supportive housing in as many zones as possible. For the purposes of this presentation, when I refer to these four housing types, I'll probably refer to them as STEP housing. Um, it's an, a new acronym that we're kind of testing out, and if you um, like it or, or don't like it, we'd like your input on that. Uh, but it stands for emergency shelters is the S, Transitional housing is the T, emergency housing is the E, and permanent supportive housing is the P. And we were previously referring to this as supportive housing, but supportive housing uh, equates best to just permanent supportive housing. And this allows us to, without a big mouthful, um, referring to each of these housing types individually. So to remove barriers, you need to make sure that you're allowing emergency, uh, these step housing types in your community but then also identifying sufficient land capacity, because if you identify, if you allow these step housing types in a very small section of your community, you're not going to be removing barriers and allowing enough of the housing to be built within your community based on what we've seen in our projections is a very large need. 
then as part of the comprehensive plan, it's also important to identify and remove other barriers. Zoning is not the only thing that's going to potentially be a barrier or allow, encourage deeply affordable housing in your community. There are other things, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And then lastly, just zoning and allowing uh, step housing types and deeply affordable housing in your community will not be enough probably to get it there. Uh, in addition to significant amounts of funding, it's important that local governments use the incentive tools that they have available to them to encourage this type of housing. It's going to be the difference between your community potentially um, obtaining a, a nonprofit housing provider coming into building houses versus another community. And we have some of these example policies uh, that you can look at in our housing element book one, appendix A. The, again, this is kind of a new um, topic area for comprehensive plans. So uh, we expect to have a lot more after the first round of periodic updates, but um, for now we do have some examples that you can look at. So when it comes to allowing a variety of these deeply affordable housing types, uh, HB 1220 did specify where some of these housing types need to be occur. So emergency housing and emergency shelters need to happen in all zones that allow hotels. There is an allowance for those uh, emergency housing and shelters to be allowed in the majority of zones within one mile of transit. And then permanent supportive housing and transitional housing need to be allowed in all zones where residential uses and hotels are allowed. These two pieces are for cities. For counties, we do encourage similar policies, similar implementation with the understanding that you are allowing them in um, areas where there's transit and services. I have a few other points here on the slide that we when you do allow uh, emergency housing and emergency shelters, we do recommend that the practice for uh, permitting those facilities is not a conditional use process if possible, that it is more of an administrative process where the affordable housing developer knows exactly what to is required of them and there's a, less um, hurdles to, uh, less process to go through to build the housing. Again, not a requirement, but a recommendation. And then on the permanent supportive housing and transitional housing, there is a key piece of statute to, um, that cities and counties should be aware of and that permanent supportive housing and transitional housing um, are by uh, in commerce's view and in many state, uh, many affordable housing developers' minds, affordable housing development because they're typically subsidized housing. And the, the user usually pays no more than 30% of their income. And therefore, these housing types should not be treated differently than regular housing types generally. So we do encourage that permanent supportive housing and transitional housing when they're regulated, aside from when they, where they're allowed, um, be regulated the same as multifamily housing. There is a provision that local governments can have reasonable occupancy spacing and intensity of use requirements on step housing types, but these need to be tied to public health and safety. And that if there are requirements on the occupancy spacing and intensity that they still not prevent the sufficient number of, of housing units that's identified through the, in the city's projected housing needs. And those housing needs will come from the countywide housing um, share and the allocation that the county and the cities work out together to decide how many housing units at each income level go to each jurisdiction. So those are kind of the basics with regard to where housing types are allowed. And we'll be providing more information on some of this with some resources that I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. But we do recommend in terms of when you're first looking at where to allow deeply affordable housing that you consider these points, but then also look at other special housing types. Where are you allowing assisted living facilities, adult family homes, single room occupancies um, in, in counties, uh, manufactured home parks? Where are you allowing these other types of housing? Co-living is now something that um, jurisdictions will need to update their codes for. We encourage allowing those in as many zones as possible to allow and remove those barriers to deeply affordable housing within our communities. Although some would argue assisted living facilities and adult family homes are not always 
affordable. They do are a critical part of our housing ecosystem that are really important, especially as so many people are going to be aging um, in the next 20 years. Then after, as I mentioned, after you identify where these housing types need to go, um, it's also to remove barriers, it's also important to make sure that you are allowing these housing types um, in as many zones as possible. For permanent supportive housing, uh, it's important to identify the sufficient land capacity for those housing types. Typically, permanent supportive housing um, in the past few years has been built in the form of multifamily housing. Um, and sometimes permanent supportive housing is scattered site housing where a single individual housing unit is acquired and built, but typically it's multifamily housing. So when you think about making sure that you have enough land capacity uh, and enough places to build that housing, um, you're looking at sufficient capacity for multifamily housing. So that will be um, the way that you accommodate permanent supportive housing and your land capacity. Then with regard to emergency housing and emergency shelters, we are recommending that jurisdictions do a quant uh, quantitative land capacity analysis. And by that, I mean, look at the actual amount of acreage and the amount of a buildable area in those acreage that can be used to build emergency housing. Much of this work will come from the multifamily housing analysis that you do in this previous step, which overlaps with your extreme, your lower income housing segments and your land capacity analysis. We do have detailed guidance on this, but generally what this means is saying, can you build enough um, uh, beds, emergency housing or emergency shelter beds in the areas where you've zoned multifamily housing. And if not, then you probably need to allow emergency housing in more areas. This will probably come into play more in jurisdictions that are primarily residential, that don't have a lot of multifamily zones. Um, this, will, this will probably need to have a little bit closer of uh, an examination. Whereas in jurisdictions who have large downtowns or a lot of multifamily zoned area, um, this process will probably be a little bit easier because the zoning capacity, as you'll find in our guidance, overlaps with multifamily housing. And we do want to point out here for counties that um, deeply affordable housing is not recommended for areas outside of urban growth areas. Typically, this deeply affordable housing um, is for residents who either don't have a vehicle or um, have very limited access to a vehicle and who need support services and need to have access to um, medical facilities, jobs, training, um, and need a little bit, uh, need more access to that. And therefore, um, that's not possible in most jurisdictions outside of urban growth areas because of the lack of transit. After identifying where deeply affordable housing can go in your community, there's other processes that and regulations that limit and create barriers to affordable housing. So as jurisdictions review their regulations and identify where they can make adequate provisions for all economic segments, we recommend that jurisdictions document those barriers and review those barriers that are creating barriers to deeply affordable housing. We have an adequate provisions checklist in our guidance that walks you through some of the questions you may want to examine as you identify and remove, identify those barriers to remove them in light of creating more opportunities for deeply affordable housing. I'll walk through a little bit of what that include entails, but in general, there are kind of three main groupings of barriers to uh, implementing uh, or developing deeply affordable housing. There's development regulations, and that can come in the form of uh, de maximum densities or FARs, uh, off-street parking. It's a big barrier to deeply affordable housing. Uh, individuals in deeply affordable housing are less likely to have vehicles. So having parking requirements that are on par with market rate housing is a, a significant barrier when you consider that parking spaces are 20 to 40 or more thousand dollars of parking space, uh, building height regulations, and then your commercial zones, ground floor retail requirements can be examples of development regulation barriers that are particularly applicable to deeply affordable housing. Um, in some cases, you also see that open space requirements or design requirements 
um, may also be something that um, may be a barrier to deeply affordable housing when their numbers and uh, performers are so tight and they have to balance five to 10 funding sources, those, every little inch of um, regulations um, can mean that can be a make or break for an affordable housing development. But in addition to that, local governments have lots of ways that they can remove barriers as they permit and allow uh, 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 shuttle through the, the allowance of affordable housing projects, um, mainly through the permitting process, but also through the, um, the timelines that they do for permitting, the fees that are required, and the types of information that are, are provided to, to, to developers as they build. So we recommend that jurisdictions look at these types of things. As I mentioned before, we recommend that they uh, limit uh, the use of conditional use permits for these types of projects and make them as streamlined and as clear and as straightforward as possible to remove the uncertainty, which is um, will be a barrier to deeply affordable housing projects. I put funding tools here. I know that local governments have limited funding tools available to them and that deeply affordable housing development is, is needs to be supported by beyond resources beyond local governments. The local governments do have a few tools available to them. We've documented all of those tools that those funding sources that are available pre this legislative session and our housing element guidance. And we encourage you to take a look at that because those funding tools, when your local government is on board and is supportive of providing the limited local funding tools that they have available, that is a huge resource that even if it is a small portion makes affordable housing projects more likely. It entices nonprofit developers to come to your jurisdiction and can play a big role in helping get some of these facilities off the ground in your community. We encourage you to take a look at that and identify where your local government could explore those opportunities in the future. There are also additional barriers for um, emergency housing and permanent supportive housing that are unique to those housing types. So for example, some jurisdictions or have put in spacing requirements from parks, schools, or other facilities, or they put arbitrary limits on occupants. Some of those things um, have a bigger, have a specific impact on step housing types. And we encourage you to review those and determine the, the basis for them and go back to the policy objective that you developed in your comprehensive plan and and see if it's consistent. And then if it can be any concerns, community concerns can be mitigated in a way that removes those barriers. Um, these are a few of the other ones that we've seen. And we encourage you to uh, take a look at those as you develop your regulations. And then as you identify these barriers, it's important to, um, to take the next step and identify what the actions are to remove those barriers. Um, as I mentioned in the housing element requirements, jurisdictions are required to identify barriers and then actions to remove those barriers. They don't have to take the actions now, but the intent of the legislature with the new housing element updates was to identify what changes need to be done or work towards in the future to remove those barriers. I've included a few examples here. For example, if you have a slow permitting process, you may want to look at how you can expedite that permitting by streamlining um, new staff that have come on board. And for example, also removing conditional use processes. We, for example, recommend that permanent supportive housing be regulated the same as multifamily housing. So perhaps removing a conditional use process or removing an extra requirement that is required for, for permanent supportive housing could be an action item that you could take to remove barriers and get that much needed housing in your community, or at least encourage that much needed housing in your community. And in addition to that, incentivizing deeply affordable housing is incredibly important because if you zone it, it might not come. But if you enc encourage it with incentives, which are available to local governments, it is more likely to come. And you can do that by waiving, by allowing additional density um, in exchange for affordability, waiving fees, 
waiving um, specific requirements, expediting permitting, and also providing free land. We encourage looking at all of these options. Um, a few examples of jurisdictions who have affordable housing incentives in their communities are on the right-hand side of the screen, and these sites will be available if you want to look more into what they have done. In addition to that, there's some unique opportunities that we think local governments can look at, particularly those smaller local governments who may not have as many uh, resources. We encourage you to allow or religious organizations more flexibility. Um, first of all, that's required by law, but also they can be great partners in encouraging affordable housing, as you'll see on some later slides, um, as well as partnering with nonprofits in your jurisdiction um, and, and or in providing infrastructure improvements. Can your public works department do a small infrastructure improvement that will aid in a vacant site being redevelopable by a nonprofit. These are some things that you could tag on to other projects um, that your city is already doing or county is already doing to support the work. We also encourage creative housing types, as you see here on the last slide, um, house sharing, a lot of bedrooms in single family homes and, um, and apartments are unused. Can there be a policy or program to implement that um, within your jurisdiction or regionally. As I mentioned, co-housing as a housing type that will need to be allowed with your development regulations updates. And also single resident occupancy units are another type of deeply affordable housing type that could be implemented in your community. I wanna wrap up with a few case studies um, and then turn it over to Darian because I know she has a lot of great content. Um, we wanted to highlight a few examples of jurisdictions who've taken some extra efforts to incentivize and remove barriers to deeply affordable housing. One of those case studies is Tacoma. They have an inclusionary zoning program. Again, inclusionary zoning may not be a great ex use of um, local resources for every jurisdiction, but in, in some jurisdictions where the housing market is um, uh, where housing prices is high and the housing market is very uh, fast moving in terms of turnover, that could be a great opportunity, especially if it's aimed at lower income housing. They also partner with public and um, nonprofits to um, support affordable housing and leveraging the land that they have available. Land that a jurisdiction has available that's not being used or underutilized is a Great, great asset to use um, to encourage affordable housing, especially as prices are encouraging. They also use local funding sources uh, that they are leveraging and have a priority permitting program uh, for affordable housing projects to usher and reduce the timeline for affordable housing projects. So they have a staff member who comes on board and helps to uh, walk those projects through the permitting process in a faster way with the goal of reducing the permitting time by 50%. And lastly, the city has authorized and supported emergency shelter sites, which allows for those to be built more quickly. Burien has a unique program where they have an affordable housing demonstration program where they allow, at the moment, five projects to come in that allow um, provide deeply affordable housing. So if a housing affordable to households making 50% of area median income or less and provide flexibility to the development regulations based on the needs of the project. And in exchange, get that deeply affordable housing. They, with their program, they've set it up so they get a variety of different housing types through those five projects. And it allows the city to see where in their regulations um, it's helpful to be flexible to encourage deeply affordable housing. And one of the examples they, they were able to partner with is a six story, 95 unit permit supportive housing project that will serve households um, making zero to 30% AMI. So by waiving these and by um, allowing for this use um, in their jurisdiction in the areas that, that supported it um, near transit and services, um, they were able to attract a, a nonprofit affordable housing developer. And lastly, um, these opportunities are available even for smaller cities. Uh, Langley has a tiny house zoning code and adopted international tiny house building code, 
which in tandem with partnering with a local nonprofit, um, which was supported by religious organizations, was able to get these nine tiny homes um, and a one renovated single family home that supports a family um, implemented in their jurisdiction to support households making um, uh, low income. So zero to 30 or 30 to 50% AMI. Each of these homes is 264 square feet with a kitchen living room combination and costs um, a bathroom and a bedroom and costs uh, $34,000. And they encouraged local businesses and individuals to purchase the home on behalf of the jurisdiction. And then um, the nonprofits and the, the jurisdiction, the partners in this project supported on an ongoing basis, but it can be done in, in small jurisdictions as well. I'd like to close with a few uh, resources that are available. We have guidance in our uh, housing element guidance, including uh, walking through that land capacity and adequate provisions piece, uh, the adequate provisions checklist. When you're working on step housing types, and I apologize, it didn't update supportive housing to step, we have a checklist for jurisdictions that we recommend using to show you what we look for when we're reviewing those regulations so it's consistent with state law because there are some regulations that, that you may or may not be aware of. And lastly, we have a variety of resources that we're currently developing at the moment to help jurisdictions develop these step housing types in their community and, and regulations in their community. And that's a state of the practice, which understands what jurisdictions are currently doing, um, how that's consistent or not with state and federal law, a model ordinance, a model ordinance user's guide and best practices guide to understand how do you regulate these different types of ele elements of step projects, which are a little bit different than other housing types, and some communications tools that we're developing, um, and this will be ready in June. And with that, I'd like to introduce Darian Lightfoot, and thank you so much for having me. Hey, Laura. Right, I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, I think I got it up here. All right, um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Darian Lightfoot. I'm the Director of Housing and Homeless Response at the City of Olympia. I have Joyce Phillips with me today, a principal planner who will be able to make me sound smart in the planning world if you all have any questions at the end. So yeah, I'm excited to get after it. I've also been um, looking at the Q&A a little bit, and I'm hoping to integrate some of the questions from my perspective into the presentation, and I'll do my best. So um, I'm going to go over Olympia's housing ecosystem, talk about our emergency housing permit process, um, talk about some temporary housing sites, our permanent supportive housing process, permanent supportive housing sites, our projects that we've had success around, and then some key takeaways. Um, okay, so setting the setting the stage, laying the foundation for what the city of Olympia is working on. So um, currently we have an emergency declaration on homelessness that was declared in 2018. And what that did for the city was to really acknowledge the impacts that's happening um, in our community and acknowledging that people are suffering and that the city of Olympia wants to take action to address that. And it also allows some flexibility around our council and contracting processes. It tightens those up so we can act as if we are experiencing emergency. It allows funding to be a little bit more flexible um, and just to prioritize housing and homeless response since it is a declared community emergency. We redo that declaration every year um, so we can continue to put housing at the forefront. And yes, that is emergency housing. And, and I, that, that is why it's referred to emergency housing because we have that declaration, not in terms of a climate disaster or, um, or some sort of a hazardous event. This is around the emergency declaration of homelessness. In 2018, the city of Olympia also uh, adopted our one community plan. That was a community-driven response around 
homelessness and how we feel we can best support residents in our community being impacted by homelessness. This worked through a lot of focus groups, um, a lot of people bringing great ideas together led by service providers and how we can address this crisis and then come out on the other side um, really uh, addressing the crux of the issue. Um, it has three focus areas, streamlining and enhancing our service provision, expanding affordable housing, um, and homeless prevention, and then increase health and public safety. So those are the three elements of our one community plan. And then that was adopted in 2020. Then 2020 happened. So we um, had a put it on pause a little bit, but are really in the process of picking it back up. And you'll see that through some of the projects that we've been able to, to um, execute. We also have our housing action plan. And this really built off that second prong of our one community plan says, okay, we're addressing homelessness. We're supporting our service providers. Now, how can we come out the other side in order to have housing that's accessible for all of our community? So um, that has, has been able to be a great framework as we navigate uh, affordable housing development. We also just adopted our Olympia Strong Plan, which is driven by our economic development team. And that was meant to be an economic development plan, but really what it ended up being was an economic justice plan. And out of the 2,000 people that we were able to interface with throughout Olympia Strong, the, the highest priority that came out of it was the need for affordable housing. So yes, we are trying to talk about economic development, but really we see this as how can we address economic justice and, and, and have everyone feel stable in their life in the city of Olympia. And that really starts with housing and the steep increase that we're seeing um, to, to our residents and the cost of living. And then the comprehensive plan. Um, so we have this foundation and this housing ecosystem that allows us to set the scene and move things forward. And that will be, it It already has, but will continue to infiltrate our com a comprehensive plan, which then set, sets the stage for, for where Olympia is going. So um, this is just the scene and, and what I'm able to really look back at with our city council and say we are implementing the community's vision. We are moving forward on what the city and the community has decide, decided what our vision is. So it's really a great Great, great resources and tools for us to have this so we can continue to build to build off of it. Um, okay, so I, I want to just give a lay of the land of the staff of our housing team. Um, we're still pretty new, but how we have it set up has been really helpful. So I just wanted to shed some light. Um, so I oversee eight staff members and we have four dedicated specifically to homelessness response. And so they are on the ground, um, responding to urgent need, addressing encampment management, hygiene, um, any sort of waste um, removal, doing like case management light, connecting people to resources, helping people get connected to their coordinated entry um, placements. If that's, if we, if someone comes up on the current entry list um, and they connect really closely with our providers in the community. We have a really great relationship with our service providers. So those four folks are really in the field consistently and overseeing all of our emergency housing and tiny home villages. Um, and then we have four staff dedicated specifically to affordable housing development and that looks and, and affordable housing stability. I think that's a good piece that I like to highlight. Preservation and stability is something that I like to lead with. Our, our most affordable housing is already built. So how can we really have a good landscape of that? find what housing needs to be preserved, find what could become affordable, and and, and um, make sure we're including that in our envisioning. So we have uh, the work on, on the other four staff are around renter protections, navigating federal funding. We have a really close relationship with our climate team. We understand that climate and housing are, are intertwined and how we can reduce costs to housing impacts energy efficiency. And often those two crises or those two elements are pitted against each other, but we do not believe that. We can integrate, we can make our funding application stronger, we can build a healthier, greener community if climate and housing are working together. So our affordable housing team is doing that. 
Um, they lead our incentive support. So you heard Laura talking about incentives and I'll, I'll mention those at the end of our, at the end of this presentation, but we have someone that sits on all of our site plan review meetings and listens to every single development project coming through the city. And maybe they're not looking to develop affordable housing then, but it builds a connection between our housing staff and developers that say, oh, I'm looking at this parcel, maybe a year out, or I would like to develop affordable housing, but I don't really know how, or I thought about the MFTE, but is it for me? And she can hear that and engage with the developer and maybe see if they would like to play. They they have interest and they would bite. So um, having that person in on all our site plan review meetings has been incredibly helpful. As you heard about the case study of Tacoma, that's what what um, we're doing here in Olympia too, this like concierge sort of support that is enticing market rate developers to play in the affordable housing game and is really connected to all of our affordable housing developers to help them move through the process efficient and with support. It helps save them cost. It shows that we're invested in their success. We want to remove hiccups if they are there. And so that staff member is really dedicated to that. And we've seen some 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 great success. Also working on anti-displacement and, and affordable home ownership. Um, we're starting to figure out ways how we can incentivize affordable home ownership. So this is the lay of our land for housing and homes response at the city of Olympia. Um, so our emergency housing process um, again was kind of built off of our emergency um, declaration on homelessness and how we can set up emergency housing facilities. So just to um, set it up, 97% of the city, this is provided by Joyce, thank you so much, um, is allowed to have emergency housing facility or low income housing. There's not like a restricted area in Olympia that can or can't ha can have this type of housing except for industrial light. Um, but that's, it's allowable really anywhere in the city if you follow this emergency housing process. So, um, how we've gone about it is, um, we've identified a location and it's typically city owned land. All of our, most of our current emergency housing facilities are in city owned land. And once we've identified the spot that we would like to set up this emergency housing facility, then we bid out the operations. The city does not operate any of these sites. A service provider does all of that for us. So we say we have the land. Here's how much money we have. We're expecting these amount of people to be served each year. And here are our goals and expectations. Um, we select our provider, we hold a community meeting, a larger neighborhood community meeting with the provider and hear concerns, hear potential impacts, um, and really learn about fears that the community would have. And then we integrate that into the scope, do our best to decrease that tension or decrease those fears that the neighbors are having, and then work to execute the contract and then hold another community meeting that says, this is what the scope says, here are the expectations, here are the people that can be contacted if you have concerns, and here's what we're hoping the outcomes of this site will be. And then we finalize the contract and issue the emergency housing permit. And then the city operates um, pretty routine site visits. I would say the homeless response team is at all of our emergency housing facilities weekly, a couple times a week, I would say. And then our typical building review fire marshal will visit the site um, every three months or sooner if there's need to just to make sure that things are operating smoothly. Um, so this is how those, how it works out. Um, and this is the high level, but I'm going to go through our specific permit so you can see really clearly what we have set up. So when you when you have a permit like this, I also saw a question that's like, what happens when your city council aren't on board or your leadership aren't on board? What I would recommend is developing some sort of emergency housing facility checklist and getting everyone on board that you need. And if an application or if a program meets those meets that checklist, then it moves forward. It's not at the discretion of, well, you know, a, a little bit of bias here, kind of subjectivity here. It's if your 
program meets these needs, then it is allowed to move forward. And it's hard to be able to plan for these units, but then not really want them in your community. Developing these standards will allow you to say they've met the standards, we move forward, and we're able to address people that are suffering and are at this income level or at the state that needs this type of housing. So we have that set up. In our proposal, we require a site plan, an operations plan, and a code of conduct. This is what we have to have as a bare minimum from the service provider to say what's going to happen in the community, what's going to happen in the neighborhood, and how is the site going to be operated. Um, and then we have the permit expectations that are more of the operational technical pieces of the permit. And that says there are no permanent structures. So these are temporary units, temporary tiny homes, temporary bathroom facilities, temporary laundry facilities, community centers, all of them are more set up in a temporary, in a temporary way. Um, and then they have the appropriate hygiene, making sure that facilities are clean and can support residents. Um, there are all of the fire safety requirements and that has to be a bit subjective because it's not your typical building setup. Um, you have to be able to work with your, with your building with your building's team and say, this is a bit of a unique site and to have some big picture understanding of what we're trying to do and house people during a crisis like this. So, um, but just, but also wanting the, say, the site to be safe. So um, developing what fire safety looks like and then having a record who was on the site and then allowing city support to come on the site and be able to check in with the provider, see how residents are doing, make sure things are operating in a healthy way. Um, and this is what the permit expectations are and what city staff will be checking up and on. And then we have the community engagement requirements. Um, we require that a neighborhood meeting is held every quarter. And that's for all residents, all surrounding neighbors and businesses to come and share their concern. You know, we're seeing uptick on traffic. We're seeing more trash. Um, residents are walking through our yard, just typical things that you're going to experience. And then to be able to share those and mitigate pass forward together. Each of our tiny home village has a site council. And so often um, site council members are encouraged to really attend those meetings and to be engaged and to help troubleshoot neighborhood impacts. Um, and then there's also a proximity requirement on how close emergency housing facilities can be next to each other, just so we're not saturating some neighborhoods and then other neighborhoods aren't receiving any sort of um, impact from these potential facilities. So. This is um, the three main pages from our emergency housing facility checklist. And then we have this last one that's points of contact um, and who we would address in the case of an emergency. And again, if all of these are followed, then it's not a case of should it be approved or shouldn't it be approved. All of the areas have been met. We have a secure provider. The city owns the land and we're looking to move forward and, and open up these units for our residents. So um, that's what I would suggest and try to develop a baseline. And if the needs are met, then you can move forward with a facility uh, of this kind. And then we renew the, the permit every six months. And that doesn't go through the full renewal process. It's just really housing, um, our housing team, our planning team, and the site operator checking in, making sure everything's up to, up to standards, the site's still operating, and then renewing the permit. Um, and then every three years, there needs to be a full permit renewal process, another community meeting, um, uh, and a uh, tweak to the contract to make sure we're just staying current. But um, this is what our emergency housing facility checklist looks like. Here's a snapshot of our emergency housing units in the community and what they cost. Currently, the city of Olympia has about 200 emergency housing units, and that costs us um, about $3.7 million a year to operate. Um, these, uh, this is partially funded with our home fund, our one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax, one of the funding, excuse me, options that Laura mentioned earlier. The city adopted our home fund in 2019. During that time, it had to go to the voters, but currently it's now councilmatic, so councils can adopt that in order to have funding for um, 
housing homeless response. And so that's not all the funding. We don't generate enough revenue for that, but we combine funds with our 1406 state support, county support, and this is what it costs annually to operate our 200 units of emergency housing. Um, okay, so now I'm moving over to permanent support costs. Okay. So um, I'm just starting off with our with a most recent project of, of permanent supportive housing, and this is a family support center, um, their project called The Landing. This is 62 units of 30% AMI uh, for families, so two and three bedroom units. Um, the city first started this project in 2017. That's why I like to highlight this one to show just how, what a positive impact to Olympia was and what a bear, what a what what a team it took to stand up a project like this. So we started in 2017, purchased the land with CDBG, um, and then started working through the funding sources. It has 12 different funding sources. Thank you, CHIP, Connecting Housing to Infrastructure Program. Thank you, Commerce, for the two and a half million dollars for this project. Um, and but but total it was about a 29 million dollar project for 62 units and um but but a reason that i like to to highlight this is because um it's uh it's a hard project to develop but it was so impactful and it has momentum and a phase two is coming. So we have, we got in early, we got the momentum, 62 units, but now Family Support Center is looking to, to do a second project in the Jason parcel. Um, so this is where we've seen a project have six and cess around uh, Perms for Housing. Okay, moving on to the next one. Um, here's our uh, uh, project called Unity Commons. Um, the city has had a lot of success around purchasing the land. So this was our first home fund project. We purchased this parcel, this whole thing right here, and then split it up into phased projects. So um, the Low Income Housing Institute developed developed the the um, project. We have a fifty eight. Um, unit shelter bed on the first floor and then permanent supportive housing on on floors two through five. And this was a collaboration um, between Lehigh and Interfaith Works and yeah, has shelter and housing and it was our first home fund project. And then right here, this this parcel is being developed and should be open this summer. So this is the advantage when you purchase land, um, you can have a first phase project and then you can have a next phase project and then you can just continue to add permanent support housing units into your larger portfolio. Um, okay, moving on to the next one. Okay, so the city of Olympia had a downtown mitigation site a handful of years back. It was at a city owned parcel that we um, were operating more as this kind of a managed encampment that then moved to what is now Quinn Street Village, a hundred unit um, tiny home village, which was incorporated in our emergency housing facility. And now that it is cleared and not a tiny home village, we're developing it into per permanent supportive housing. Um, and so that is a cycle that the city is working on. We purchase land, temporary housing, bring it up to code. And so doing some right of way improvements, um, seeing what the city can remain in our wheelhouse using our public works department to get the land a little nicer and then maybe have some temporary housing and then as the funding is developed develop it into into permanent housing so this is just a pre-sub um rendering it'll change of course but i just wanted to highlight another example of what we're trying to do and developing in our downtown is really tough because it's fill, so it just is more expensive to develop. You can't have housing on the first floor, and so we have to be creative on what's on the first floor, um, but it's really close access to transit, opens us up to more opportunities for funding. So what we've what we've decided to do is add some respite beds, that, op that increases our opportunities for different funding, and um, we're going to partner with an economic development partner in order to provide some workforce development support on the first floor. So again, that connects um, to the larger community need, you can connect with residents in order to um, 
receive workforce development support, and we're meeting the requirements of the downtown and using a city-owned parcel to develop affordable housing. Um, and this is the one that is still in its early stages. So we have a developed site, we have a phase two developed, we have a rendering, and here's our kind of most recent early project that we're working on. This is um, our Franz Anderson site. So the city owns this whole parcel. Um, this triangle here is currently a tiny home village. It's a 50 unit tiny home village and it's low barrier and it's for people just exiting homelessness directly from an encampment into a tiny home village. This parcel right here, the city executed a request for proposals and said, we have this land, we're going to develop this road. We're going to put in some sidewalks some stormwater. We're going to do some infrastructure development here. We will give you the land. We will do these right of way improvements. We'll give it to you for $1. Who will take this land and develop it into permanent, permanent supportive housing? So um, I'm going to unshare this quick, bring this up. So here is... Hopefully you can. Okay. Here is our city's website, Franz Anderson Road, permanent supportive housing development. We have our, um, you know, request for, for, for proposals right here. And it it's really comprehensive on all the things that we're looking for in order to continue this project. Um, what we're expecting, having a combined funders application and just the expectations of what we want the site to be. Here's Here's um, how we'll be scoring the project. And um, I, we hosted a, um, a forum that you know solicited questions from potential providers. And then we have um, the presentation that we have for folks to view. So um, this is just how we're currently operating um, our permanent supportive housing and how we find that to be successful. Um, Darian, we're running a little yes. short on time, so, so maybe if we could wrap yep. up and then we can, uh, maybe folks can hang on. If you're interested, we can try to field a few questions and tell about 405. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. So... Okay, so um, I skipped a couple slides, but um, I will just talk about how we incentivize housing, and we do that with impact fee reductions. We do that with um, removing all parking minimums. Um, we've streamlined our permit process. We've expanded our MFTE, and we do a lot of grant support. So if uh, affordable housing project comes to us with dirty land, then we're ready to support them through Department of Ecology grant. Um, through CHIP, we just were awarded an EV readiness um, EV readiness grant through Commerce in order to establish EV readiness in a multifamily. So we're prepared to help projects with grant support um, if that be the case. So takeaways: I would suggest doing a land inventory, see which um, what land your city owns, seeing if you um, could use your current lane for temporary housing or permanent supportive housing. Siting is really, really challenging. There'll always be some finicky snags around siting. Um, temporary housing can transition to permanent housing. Um, use your public works team that already knows this work to invest in right-of-way improvements to help to offset the cost of the project. And don't be afraid of wonky land. You can take it, you can clean it, you can do the intro development, and then it would potentially become um, a project really valuable to your community. Awesome. That was great. Um, really great information from both Laura and Darian. Um, so yeah, we're, we are at four o'clock, but I think we're going to take a, just a, a few minutes here to, to answer questions if folks want to hang out for uh, a few questions. To um, um, Thanks so much for submitting those. So maybe Darian, a question for you. Uh, can you speak to how the first home fund is funded, um, where the money comes within the city to purchase land? Yeah, the, the home fund is the one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax. We also have the 1406 sales tax that generates about um, maybe three and a half million dollars a year. That is also combined with the county-wide home fund that we now have a connection with. So we, we generate about $7 million a year locally to do projects like that, to purchase land, be first in, et cetera. Great. 
Um, and a question uh, if, if you're able to share the request for proposals, I think we could send out some links afterwards if you have something you could share. Great. Um, Laura, question for you, I think. Um, uh, can you confirm that emergency housing is not for people in the wake of disaster, natural or otherwise? Can you talk a little bit about um, emergency housing in that context? Um, it is, I don't think the prime intent of emergency housing is it, for those um, in need of housing due to emergency disasters, but it wouldn't preclude that. So the 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 thought for emergency housing, the based on my interpretation of the definition that is that it's ha emergency housing so short-term housing at any point in the year at any time not just because of um, emergencies or natural disasters but it could be used for that great uh, maybe just one last question here kind of a big one and i know darian touched on it a little bit but any advice about how to handle public or city councils where there may be public opposition to this type of housing. So Laura, do you want to add any anything onto that or or Darian as well? I would defer to Darian in just a second, but I would say think about the, your overall policies of your community and think about your community needs. Cause I think that everybody has in their community somebody who is in need of short-term housing or permanent supportive housing. And it's important to think about who those neighbors are in your community and and advocate for their needs because they're not being, probably not being met, and then ask how you can best meet those um, with your city council. But Darian probably has been up more times than me, and so I'll defer to her if she has any last closing comments. No, I, I would say create your standards, share with the community the vision of what we're trying to do, and then you have to move forward. Like people are going to be upset and going to be impacted, but I think staying true to the overall vision is just kind of what you need to do to to move the needle. Right. Well, we really appreciate everyone's time. So I want to kind of wrap us up. Um, and let me just share our final, final slide. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we uh, really appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, if you have additional questions or want to um, kind of follow up in any way, um, you could drop us a line at our plan review email, planreview at plan review at psrc.org. Uh, 